Hello and welcome back, Discovery Learners, to another episode of Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program. It is I, Teacher Liz, here, your host once more on today, Thursday. On this episode, we're going to go over some observances, interesting history, I'll be showing you some cool landmarks, animals, pretty plants, and of course, some interesting facts. So let's not delay any further. Let's start the show. And now for our daily observances. Hey, Discovery Learners. It's time for the observances. Today's first observance is National Awkward Moments Day. On March 18th, we recognize National Awkward Moments Day. This is an annual day that every person can relate to. We all have had our awkward moments from time to time. Have you ever called someone by the wrong name, tripped over nothing, walked into a door, had the completely wrong words come out of your mouth, or just forgot what you were doing? The list could go on and on. Sometimes things just don't seem right and then something happens that may make you feel like you want to run and hide. No matter the day, today, or any other day, everyone has them. How can you observe National Awkward Moments Day? Well, you can just find a way to laugh at yourself. Maybe relive an awkward moment with a friend, or post your favorite awkward moment that you've had in the comment section below. Our next observance is National Lacey Oatmeal Cookie Day. There are cookie holidays, and then there's National Lacey Oatmeal Cookie Day. Each year on March 18th, this holiday celebrates a delicate cookie made from oats. Some people may refer to this National Oatmeal Cookie Day, which is celebrated on April 30th. The difference between the two is that lacy oatmeal cookies are wafer thin and typically accompanied by a scoop of ice cream or sorbet. In the early 1900s, oatmeal became a major ingredient in the American diet. Before that, Americans relied on other grains. Originating in England, oatmeal cookies have been around since the 1800s. However, it is believed that they were created after the oat cake. Soldiers used to carry oat cakes with them for a quick boost of energy during battle. Most research found that the first recorded oatmeal raisin cookie recipe was written by Fanny Merritt Farmer in 1896. Considered a healthy food, the cookie quickly became popular. By the 1900s, a recipe for the delicious treats appeared on containers of Quaker oats. Bakers use many different recipes for lacy oatmeal cookies. Additionally, home bakers bake with a variety of oats including old-fashioned oats. Quick oats, oat bran, oat flour, and for healthy cookies, they add finely chopped or ground fruits such as raisins or nuts and use sugar substitute. You can also decorate your lacy oatmeal cookies with icing drizzled on top of the cookies. How can you observe National Lacy Oatmeal Cookie Day? Well that's easy. Why not whip up a batch of your own? Or maybe go to the store and get some plain old oatmeal cookies and decorate them with your favorite drizzle. I like frosting on mine. Let us know in the comment section below what kind of cookie is your favorite. Our last observance for the day may be the best observance ever, National Sloppy Joe Day. No matter how you make this hot sandwich on March 18th to celebrate National Sloppy Joe Day, the Sloppy Joe is one of America's all-time favorite sandwiches. Its main ingredient is often ground beef. However, others use turkey and buffalo too. The other elements give it its flavor through onions, tomato sauce, brown sugar, even soda pop, maple syrup to sweeten it, and other seasonings to spice it up. And of course, any secret ingredient families may have added over the years. All of it's served on top of a hamburger bun or roll, and it's ever so sloppy. Be sure to grab more and more napkins. Who created this Sloppy Joe? Well, there are different claims to the origin of Sloppy Joe. In Havana, Cuba, in the 1930s, there were a genuine bartender who gained popularity with vacationers who went by the name of Sloppy Joe. He earned the name for his less than enthusiastic way of cleaning the bar. He was, however, an attentive bartender, and the bar was a hot spot for the jet set. However, no mention is found of the peppers from the era of a hot sandwich on the menu matching the description of a Sloppy Joe, and the man of the same name retired to Spain in 1933. However, there was a place called the Town Hall Deli in Maplewood, New Jersey that has a direct connection to the Sloppy Joe of Havana fame. It opened in 1927, and during the 1930s, Maplewood's Mayor Sweeney traveled to Havana, where he met the bartender named Sloppy Joe and was served this delicious sandwich. The mayor came back to New Jersey, and with a well-developed taste for the Sloppy Joe sandwich, 
The mayor enjoyed it so much, he asked one of the town hall deli's proprietors, Fred Hines, to replicate it. According to the website, it was made with coleslaw, ham, cow tongue, Swiss cheese, and lots of dressing and was served on thin rye bread, hence the origin of the Sloppy Joe sandwich, and how Town Hall Deli of South Orange became the birthplace of the Sloppy Joe. Then, in 1934, at the Ye Old Tavern Inn in Sioux City, Iowa, Abraham and Bertha laid claim to the Sloppy Joe when they added loose meat sandwich on their menu in 1934. Whoever brought the Sloppy Joe to the world, Hunts made it more convenient in 1969, when they put it in the can and called it Manwich. Today, many families have their own secret recipes that make their Sloppy Joe special, whether it's an unusual spice, a novelty ingredient, or a homemade tomato sauce. A Sloppy Joe lends itself to originality and personality. A new flavor is just around the corner. In the South, you might come across a barbecue flavor. In the North, it might be a little sweeter. What's your flavor? It's undoubtedly an all-American food holiday. I bet you're wondering how you can observe National Sloppy Joe Day. Well, it's simple. Try a new Sloppy Joe recipe out. Start with a base one and maybe add a few of your own ingredients. Start a new tradition. Or have yourself a manwich. As you know, a sandwich is a sandwich, but a manwich is a meal. Let us know in the comment section below what you guys are going to eat tonight for Sloppy Joe Day. On this day in history. Today, in 1878, the city of Anaheim in California is incorporated for the second time. Anaheim is a city in Orange County, California, and it is part of the Los Angeles metropolitan area. As of 2010, United States Census, the city has a population of 336,000 people, making it the most populated city in Orange County and the 10th most populous city in California and the 55th most populous city in the United States. Anaheim is the second largest city in Orange County in terms of land and area and is known for being the home of Disneyland Resort and Anaheim Convention Center and two major sports teams, the Anaheim Ducks, which is the ice hockey team, and the Los Angeles Angels, which is the baseball team. Anaheim was founded by 50 German families in 1857 and incorporated as the second city in Los Angeles County on March 18, 1976. Orange County was split off from Los Angeles County in 1889. Anaheim remained a largely agricultural community until Disneyland opened in 1955. This led to the construction of several hotels and motels around the area, and residential districts in Anaheim soon followed. The city also developed into an industrial center producing electronics, aircraft parts, and canned fruit. Anaheim is a charter city. Today, in 1881, Barnum and Beatty Circus, traveling as the greatest show on earth, debuts at Madison Square Garden in New York City. This particular circus will last about 146 years before closing in 2017. Today, in 1965, Pop and Fresh Pillsbury Doughboy is introduced. Pop and Fresh, or more widely known as the Pillsbury Doughboy, is an advertising mascot for the Pillsbury Company, appearing in many of their commercials. Many commercials from 1965 until 2005, together with some for Geico between 2009 and 2017, concluded with a human finger poking the doughboy's stomach. The doughboy responds when his stomach is poked by giggling. At first, it was hoo hoo, or earlier on, a slight giggle. Tee hee! <laughs> Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure born today is Vanessa Williams. Born March 18, 1963 in Millwood, New York. This American actress is best well known for her recent role in Ugly Betty and Desperate Housewives. She initially gained fame after becoming the first African American woman to earn the title of Miss America in 1984. In 2017, she began starring in a role of VH1 comedy drama, Daytime Divas. Before she was famous, she received a scholarship to Sarah Cruz University and went on to major in musical theater arts. She made her feature film debut in 1987 in the movie The Pickup Artist. 
She turns 58 years old today. Happy birthday, Vanessa. Our next notable figure born today is Queen Latifah. Born March 18, 1970 in New York, New Jersey. This American Golden Globe winning actress who was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress in her role in 2002 film Chicago. She starred in the Fox sitcom Living Single in the 90s and played roles in films like Bringing It Down the House, Girls Trip, and Hairspray. She also became the host of the Queen Latifah show on CBS. Before she was famous, she beatboxed for hip hop groups Lady Fresh in 1988. She also starred in the film Joyful Noise with Dolly Parton in 2012. She turns 51 years old today. Happy birthday, Queen Latifah. Another notable figure born today is Dane Cook. Born March 18, 1972 in Cambridge, Maryland. This American stand-up comedian and actor who was the first comic to use social networking websites such as MySpace to amass a giant and devoted fan base. On top of stand-up, he starred in the films such as Good Luck Chuck, Dan in Real Life, and My Best Friend's Girl. Before he was famous, he began his comedic career in New York, performing at comedy clubs before moving to Los Angeles. His big break came in 1998 when he did a spot on Comedy Central's Premium Blend and a showcase for the upcoming comedians. He turns 49 years old today. Happy birthday, Dane. And our last notable figure born today is Adam Levine. Born March 18, 1979 in Los Angeles, California. This American singer and guitarist for the band Maroon 5, who became known for hit songs such as Harder to Breathe and Moves Like Jagger. From 2011 to 2019, he was a coach on the popular competition show The Voice. Before he was famous, he met his bandmates Jesse Carmichael and Mickey Madden while attending Brentwood School. He also made the game-winning buzzer-beating basket to win a YMCA basketball championship. And in 2013, he worked with The Lonely Island and Kendrick Lamar on the WAC album. He turns 42 years old today. Happy birthday, Adam. Happy birthday, everyone. Come along, Discovery Learners, and we will see the landmarks of the world. As we continue our journey of discovery through Ireland, here's some landmarks we should see. Starting with the Blarney Castle. The Blarney Castle is a medieval castle in County Cork, in the southwest of Ireland. The castle was built around 1446 by the McCarthy clan, King of Desmond. At the top of the castle lies the famous stone Eloquence, which is also known as the Blarney Stone. Tourists visit the Blarney Castle and can hang upside down over the sheer drop to kiss the stone, which is said to give the gift of eloquence or the gift of gab. There are many legends as to the origin of the stone, but some say that it was the Le Fowl, a magic stone which Irish king was crowned. Well, I may already have the gift of gab, but I wouldn't mind getting a chance to hang upside down and kiss the Blarney Stone myself. Our next stop is Ben Bulben. Ben Bulben is probably the most stunning rock formation in Ireland. The Plateau Formation, which is part of the Darty Mountains, overlooks Sligo Town in the county Sligo in northwest Ireland. For those interested in climbing up Ben Bulben, it's a tough one, approximately two and a half hour climb. But on a clear day, you have a stunning view as far north as Donegal and as far south as Mayo. If you make it to Ben Bulben, you have to check out the famous Irish writer William Butler Yeats' grave, which sits in the graveyard at the foot of Ben Bulben. I would love to make it all the way up to the top. That's a long walk, but it'd be a beautiful sight. It makes me want to read some of the books by William Butler Yeats. Our next stop is the Skellig Islands. The Skellig Islands are two small, steep and rocky islands lying about 10 miles west of the Bolus Head on the Ivorau Peninsula in County Kerry. They are famous for thriving wild bird populations like gannets and puffins and also for an early Christian monastery that is now a world heritage site. There are two Skellig Islands, Little Skellig and Skellig Michael. Little Skellig is unfortunately closed to the public 
and it holds Ireland's largest and the world's second largest northern gannet colony with almost 30,000 pairs. Skellig Michael is the larger of the two islands, rising over 230 meters above sea level, with the 6th century Christian monastery perched on the ledge close to the top. Those islands sound really cool. They're very interesting and certainly very different. I would love to see puffins. Did you know the puffins are the inspiration for the porgs in Star Wars? Our next stop is the Cliffs of Moher. The Cliffs of Moher are the top tourist attractions in Ireland. The cliffs are on the southwestern edge of the Burren area near Doolin, which is located in County Clare, Ireland. The cliffs rise 394 feet above the Atlantic Ocean. The area attracts close to 1 million visitors per year. On a clear day, an Aran Island is visible from the Galloway Bay, as are the valleys of the hills of Connemara. The cliffs were recently made famous as digital backdrop in a scene in a Harry Potter film. That's really cool. I'd like to go anywhere they filmed the Harry Potter film. Our next site to see is the Aran Islands. The Aran Islands are a group of three islands located on the west coast of Ireland in Galway Bay. They are one of the most popular tourist attractions in Ireland. The three Aran Islands are Ishmore, the largest island, Ishman, and Ishir. You can get to the islands by taking a ferry or by flying in. Or if you want the full experience, maybe fly one way and take a ferry the other. I think that's the way to go. I don't know if I saved the best for last, but this is certainly probably my favorite. Guinness Storehouse in County Dublin. The Guinness Storehouse is located in the heart of St. James Gate Brewery in Dublin, which has been the home of the Black Stuff since 1759. The seven-story building, a former Guinness fermentation plant, has been remodeled into the shape of a giant pint of Guinness. A visit will teach you everything you've ever wanted to know about the world's famous beer. From how Guinness is made to the ancient craft of Guinness barrel making in the cooperage and the, on the creation of the world's famous brand. The highlight for many visitors is the Gravity Bar, where they collect their end of tour pint of Guinness and can relax and enjoy the 360 degree view across Dublin City. The facility includes three bars, the brewery, the source and gravity, a coffee shop, a restaurant, meeting and event facilities, pull the perfect pint opportunity. They even have wheelchair accessibility, complimentary car parking on Crane Street. And did I mention that end of tour pint? If I ever made my way to Ireland, I'd probably look up some of my family that I have out there. But I'd definitely start the trip with the Guinness Storehouse and probably end the trip with another visit. Wow, Ireland is pretty interesting and magical and ancient. We didn't get to cover everything but what we did cover was pretty awesome. Stay tuned for the next episode and we can finish our tour through Ireland. Here's the animal of the day. It's time for the animal discovery learners. Today's animal is the gray seal. Seals are a group of marine mammals that live in various regions around the world. They can survive in both polar and tropical waters. Seals are divided into two families, one that includes seals with ears, like sea lion, and others that include earless seals, like the common seal. There are 33 species of seal in total. Seals spend much of their time in the water, but they mate and give birth to their babies and take care of them on the shore. Their thick fur and blubber offer protection against the freezing temperatures. When they're on land, they live in huge colonies with over a thousand seals. Seals produce milk with 50% fats. Their babies gain 3 to 5 pounds daily thanks to the milk. The largest seal is in South American elephant seal. They can reach up to 13 feet in length and weigh up to 2 tons. The smallest seal is the Galapagos fur seal that has 4 feet in length and weighs about 65 pounds. A big difference. Seals have more blood in their body than other animals. Since blood cells have oxygen, they can dive deeper and longer than other animals. Seals can hold their breath for two hours, which is a record in the animal world. When seals dive, they decrease their heart rate 50 to 80 percent. An elephant seal will decrease the number of heartbeats from 112 to 20 to 50 while diving. That's real slow. A seal's diet is usually fish and squid. Seals have whiskers, like cats, that help them detect vibrations of their prey underwater. Their worst enemies are the orca, and white bears, and of course sharks. Seals 
are the victims of commercial hunting in Canada. Sadly, their fur is used in the fashion industry. If a seal can avoid predators, they can live up to 30 years. Seals are very curious and social, and oftentimes come say hi to people they find in the water, on boats, longboards, surfboards, and sometimes just playing around in the surf. Also, the gray seal is part of the folklore in Ireland about the Selkie. You might remember the Selkie from the Song of the Sea. We talked about that in our last video. You can catch the movie on Netflix. The Plant of the Day It looks like it's just about time to talk about the plant. Today's plant is the artichoke. The artichoke is a type of flowering plant that belongs to the group of thistles. This plant originates from North Africa and the Mediterranean region. Artichoke was initially cultivated and consumed in the Middle East. This plant was used as medicine and food to ancient Greeks. It was popular among wealthy citizens of the ancient Rome. Poor people were not allowed to consume the artichoke. Intensive cultivation of the artichoke in Europe started in the 15th century, and a few centuries later, the 19th century, Artichoke was introduced to the USA. Artichoke grows best in cool climates. On the well-drained rich soil, people cultivate artichokes mainly as a source of food. Other than that, artichokes can be cultivated as an ornamental plant. Artichokes can reach 4 to 6 feet high and spread 9 feet in diameter. Artichoke have deeply lobed silver gray green bronze colored leaves. Immature flowers are the edible part of the artichoke. They develop from the flower buds that grow laterally from the main stem. One plant produces 15 to 20 artichokes per year. Harvest usually takes five to six months after planting. Fully developed flower heads bears purple flowers that contain large numbers of seed. The seed of artichokes are covered with hairs that facilitate the dispersal by the wind. Artichokes can also be propagated by cutting the roots or tissue cultures. Artichokes are a rich source of dietary fibers, vitamins K, B9, C, minerals such as sodium, manganese, and magnesium. Artichokes can't be eaten raw. Artichokes can be fried, grilled, baked, cooked, microwaved, and used as a preparation of stews, soups, salads, and sauces, casseroles, or my favorite way, as a dip. Herbal tea made of artichoke is popular and often consumed in Vietnam and Mexico. Artichokes contain phenolic compounds and antioxidants that can be beneficial to the human health. Artichokes facilitate digestion and improve functions of the liver and gallbladder. Artichokes can prevent the development of coronary diseases by the reduction of blood cholesterol levels. There's a famous Italian liqueur called Sinar that is made of artichoke. Italy, Egypt, and Spain are major producers of the artichoke in the world. Nearly 100% of the artichoke that is consumed is in the USA and originates from California. Artichokes can be cultivated as annual plants, plants that complete its life cycle in one year, or perennial plants, plants that live more than two years. Well, I don't know about you, Discovery Learners, but I learned a lot about artichokes today. But I think my favorite thing about artichokes is still getting the dip when I go to TGI Fridays. How about you, Discovery Learners? How do you guys like to eat your artichokes? Let us know in the comment section below. And now for the word of the day. Today's word is famine. It's a noun. It means extreme scarcity of food, a shortage, hunger, famine. Our next word is a word you may have heard somewhere in today's episode. That word is blight. It's a noun. It means a plant disease, especially one caused by fungi, such as mildews, rust, and smuts. A thing that spoils or damages something. Blight. Let's take a look at the art of the day. Today's art is the clotter ring. It originates from the Emerald Isle of Ireland. The clotter ring is believed to have originated in the fishing village situated near the shore or clotter of Galloway Bay. The clotter outside the city walls and further separated by the river Corrib was exclusive community of fisher folk. The ring shows two hands holding a heart, which wears a crown. This motif is explained in the phrase, let love and friendship reign. An ideal wedding ring 
used by small communities for hundreds of years. This distinctive design is associated with one of the tribes of Galloway, the Joyce family. The clatter ring motif that would become so popular that it would end up on the fingers of Queen Victoria and later Queen Alexandria and King Edward VII. Images of the clatter rings can be found on debutantes, kings, and queens in paintings from that time period. The artistry of the clatter ring has lasted for more than 400 years. It's popular even today. When I proposed to teacher Liz, she received a rose gold clatter ring from me. The history and the artistry and the meaning behind the clatter ring are what makes it such a great work of art. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know that shamrocks and four-leaf clovers aren't the same thing? Well, not exactly. Over the centuries, the shamrock has developed into a proud symbol of the Irish culture. It's also one of the central symbols of Ireland's great celebration of St. Patrick's Day. Most clovers found in nature will have three leaves, but that's not always the case. Four-leaf clovers have been associated through the common folklore with good luck, mostly because their rare genetic mutation of the standard three-leaf clover. The mythology of the four-leaf clover actually predates the religious symbolism of the shamrock. In Ireland, first being mentioned in the ancient Druids, According to the folklore passed down through the ages, each leaf of the four-leaf clover represents something different. The first leaf is said to represent hope, the second represents faith, the third represents love, and the fourth represents happiness. Because of the rarity of the four-leaf clover, it's been tied in with a lot of folklore, including leprechauns. Leprechauns are believed to carry both a sack of gold and a four-leaf clover both of which are symbolic of luck and prosperity. They are also said to be the guardians of treasures, rumored to be left by the Vikings towards the end of the 9th century. At the end of the rainbow, there's said to be a four-leaf clover, a clover garden where the leprechauns hide their gold. Therefore, a rainbow is also a very important symbol associated with the four-leaf clover. So I bet you're asking, well, what is a shamrock then? A shamrock is actually a Gaelic word meaning little clover. While shamrock is often used to refer to types of clovers found in Ireland, it should be noted that the term is not actually associated with any specific species of clover. Traditionally, shamrocks have been used as a symbol of Ireland. A clover must have three leaves to be considered a shamrock. If a clover has more or less, it is not a shamrock. Hence, all shamrocks are clovers, but not all clovers are shamrocks. So a three-leaf clover is a shamrock, and a four-leaf clover is a clover. So as you see, they're not quite the same thing. Pretty interesting, huh? Yes, cue the credits. This means we have reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun, and I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. So farewell discovery learners, teacher Liz here is saying thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Don't forget to attend the live Zoom sessions provided to you every day by the Discovery Day program's educational team. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe and hit the bell icon so you're notified for all the fun here on Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program.